Okay, as you do know that in our last lecture, Angelica, are you there? Yes, Miss, I'm here. Okay. So in our last lecture, as you do know that we are on chapter number uh, 17, that is cost of capital. And we had finished almost of it. And today we are going to just, uh, going to have a look at few concepts. And today we are going to finish this chapter together with two more chapters. So anyhow, now today we are going to learn about estimation of the cost of redeemable debt. What is a redeemable debt? Uh, Aptit has joined, I feel. Good afternoon, Aptit. Good afternoon, Atif. Atif, let me know if I'm audible or not. Uh, yes, miss. Yeah, I can okay. see the screen. Okay, okay, that's great. Okay, now uh, we are going to start uh, our two new chapters today, but let's uh, let's just finish. Um, the previous chapter, which we had started earlier, that is chapter number 17, cost of capital. And we are towards the end of this chapter. We are today going to discuss about the estimation of the cost of redeemable debt. So what is a redeemable debt? A debt which is going to be redeemed after a particular time period. The amount of interest is going to be paid in continuation and towards the end of the uh, particular time period, the principal amount is also going to be returned, redeemed. So that are the properties of redeemable debt. As your slides are telling you that company will pay interest for a number of years and then repay the principal, sometimes at a premium or discount to the original loan amount. Students, are you able to see the whiteboard? Uh, not clearly, miss. Now is it visible? Yeah, but if you move camera a little bit slightly up, yes, it will be a slide up. Yes, Fine. it will. Yes. Okay. So what are the properties of the redeemable debt at that that is going to be repaid after a particular time period is known as a redeemable debt. So as we can see the slides as well, the company will pay interest for the number of years and then repay the principal, that is the basic amount, sometimes at a premium or a discount to the original loan amount. What are the assumptions which we have to keep in mind while considering the redeemable debt? The first assumption is about the market price. So the market price is the future expected income stream from the loan notes discounted at the investor's required rate of return, that is pre-tax cost of debt. So in order to calculate the market price of the redeemable debt, we have to consider future expected income stream. What is that? That is interest, which are going to be paid up to the time of redemption and the amount of the principal, which is going to be paid. So these two important payments have to be discounted at investor's required rate of return, that is pre-tax cost of debt. So that is uh, going to be the market value of the redeemable debt. They also say in the scan drawing that hence the market value of the redeemable loan notes is the sum of the present value of the interest and the redemption payment. Now, here is illustration for redeemable debt. How are we going to calculate the market value of the loan notes as we have discussed that the market value of the redeemable debt is which thing? The present value of the future income stream discounted at the investor's required rate of return. So present value of the future interest payments and the amount which is going to be redeemed at the time uh, of redemption discounted at the investor's required rate of return will be making the market value of the loan notes. So what is it basically? Present value of future interest payments plus Present value of 
redeemed principle. So these two amounts converted into the present value with the help of the investors and Y rate of return will be making the market value of the redeemable debt. Now let's see this question. The question is asking in the last line that what is the market value of the loan notes? Now loan notes can be redeemable or irredeemable once, but you are going to see the scenario in order to establish that the question is asking about redeemable debt or irredeemable debt. So same is going to happen in the case of exam as well. Loan notes can be redeemable or irredeemable, irredeemable one, but you are going to see the scenario in order to determine that which kind of loan notes are these. So let's read the scenario. A company has an issue 12% redeemable loan notes. So what is the coupon rate? It is 12% with five years to redemption. Redemption will be at par. The investors require, require a return of 10%. So my dear students, you are required to calculate the market value of the loan notes. How are you going to calculate it? Let's see. Students, what is the market value? You are required to calculate it. And they are telling us that for five years, the interest is going to be paid. I'm not sure whether you are able to see the solution either from the board or not. This is how Angelica manages. <laughs> so anyhow, from year one to five, the interest is going to be paid. And at the end of the year five, the amount is going to be redeemed at par. How much amount is going to be redeemed at par? Students, if nothing is mentioned, what is the assumed face value of the loan notes? Can anyone tell me if you are revising the concepts? Uh, at twelve percent percentage. No. What is the face value of the loan notes? Is you one hundred? What is the nominal value of the loan notes? Hundred. Yes, sir. At this stage, you must be knowing about these basic points. It shows that maybe you are not revising the concept. So, students, at the end of the year five. Because at par, the loan notes have to be redeemed. So $100 is going to be redeemed. So we have to convert them into their present value. Then from year one to five, how much interest is going to be paid students? It's 12%. 12 percent. 12 percent of 100, it is 12. So yearly payment will be 12. Okay, so market value has to be concluded. The investors require a return of 10%. So your discount rate is 10%. Now you have to calculate the present values. So from one to five, from year one to year five, twelve dollars is going to be paid. So what is the annuity factor for ten percent for year five? Please see from your notes and tell me. We are going to apply the annuity factor. What is the annuity factor at ten percent for fifty years? Tell me because I don't have that table with me. 3.791. 3.791. Okay. Then we have to calculate the present value of the $100 amount. What is the present value factor for year 5 at 10%? Tell me. 0. 0.621. 0. 0.621. Okay. Let's see So now calculate the present value. Discounting factor. Multiply by the cash flow, so 12 multiplied by 3.791 first. How much it is? 45.492. And the present value of $100 to be redeemed at par, $100 multiplied by 0.621 is $62.1. Am I right, students? Yes, miss. So now, what will be the market value when we are going to add up both of these present values, 45.492 plus 62.1, we are going to get the market value of this redeemable debt. So 62.1 plus 45.492. How much it is? 45.492 plus 62.1. In total, it is 107.592. This is the market value. And my dear students, what will be the NPV? NPV will be zero. Students, are you understanding the concept? Try to absorb the concept.
concept as well. NPV is zero because that debt is going. So, Miss, to can be... we repeat again? Like I was uh, confused. Sorry? So, can can we repeat uh, re repeat the calculation again? Calculation? Yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, after if you do have a uh, soft copy of the book with you, it's yeah. better. And I'm going to tell you the calculations you can just see from here as well. Okay. Yeah. Now, for the market value of the redeemable debt, I have told you that it is equal to the present value of the future income stream. So, future income stream for the redeemable debt is the interest payments and the amount of principal which is going to be redeemed at the end of the particular time period. So, in this case, from year one to five, we are going to pay an interest of 12. And at the end of year five, we are going to return the principal amount that is $100. So both of these have to be converted to the present value in order to calculate the market value. So on interest payments of $12, we are going to apply the NVT factor since from year one to year five, if NVT the interest is going to be paid. So 10% is the investor's required rate of return. So at 10%, we are going to apply the NVT factor for year five, that is 3.791. So 3.791 multiplied by the cash flow of 12, the present value is 45.492. Then since the debt is going to be redeemed at par, as written in the scenario, 100, so we are going to apply the present value factor because only it is not being paid in perpetuity. It is not being paid in perpetuity or in annuity. That is why we are not going to apply the annuity factor and present value factor is going to be applied for it. So for year 5 at 10%, the present value factor is 0.621. So 0.621 multiplied by 100 is 62.1. Now 62.1 plus 45.492 will be the market value of these redeemable non notes. So why market value is basically equal to the uh, present value of the future income stream because at the end of the particular time period, the amount is going to become zero. So net present value has to be zero. The net present value for redeemable debt will be zero because in future it has to be redeemed. Got it now? Yes, sir. Okay, now students, let's extend our discussion regarding redeemable debt. Over here, we have ignored uh, the factor of interest. Okay, so as we have discussed that there is a pre-tax cost of debt and post-tax cost of debt as well. Pre-tax cost of debt is basically the required rate of return by debt providers. And post-tax cost of debt is basically the cost of capital for the company. Are you clear about both of these things? So if you are required to calculate the post-tax cost of debt, then you have to consider uh, the tax factor also in your calculations. If you are calculating the pre-tax, then there is no need for that. Got it? So now, as you can see the slide they have written, the return an investor requires can therefore be found by calculating the IRR of the investment flows. So basically, my dear students, if you are required to calculate the return an investor is requiring, it is going to be calculated by calculating an IRR of the investment flows. As you can see, the calculations which is written in the slide in front of you, at year zero, we are going to calculate the market value. That will be in negative. Then from year one to, uh, the, uh, you know, in, in, up to the time period in which the interest is required, we are going to calculate the interest payments. And then you are going to calculate the amount which is going to be redeemed. That is the principal amount. So ultimately, the NPV is going to be zero. Am I right? Since interest payments and capital repayment together will be making the total of market value. So the same amount of market value is going to be deducted from the same amount of the sum of interest payments and capital repayments. So your NPV will be zero. So that's what they are telling that the required return by an investment is going to be the IRR of the investment flows because IRR is the rate of return at which the NPV of the project is zero. Do you remember students? What is IRR? It is a point where NPV of the project is zero. Anyhow, let's do this understanding. 
Now they are requiring us to calculate the return required by debt providers, pre-tax cost of debt. So students in pre-tax cost of debt, are you going to consider the tax or not in pre-tax cost of debt? Are you going to consider tax in it or not? Students, it's pre-tax. So you are not no. going to, not going to yeah. So you are not going to incorporate taxation in it. But now for here, what you are required to calculate, you are required to calculate the required rate of return by debt providers. So it's not similar to the previous question. <laughs> Over there, you were, you were simply required to calculate the market value. And over here, you have to calculate the percentage at which you are going to discount your cash flows to get the NDV as zero. So simply, what you are required to calculate over here in, in this understanding? What is the rate at which NDV is zero? Uh, IRR. Very so in this question, you are actually required to calculate an IRR, at which the NPV of the project is zero. zero. So let's start doing it. Let's read this scenario. A company has an issue 12% redeemable debt. So 12% is coupon rate with five years to redemption. The uh, time period in which the debt has to be redeemed is five years. Redemption is at par. 100 is going to be returned, converted to its present value. The current market value of the debt is 107.59. The corporation tax rate is 30%. So now they have given us all of the data, but the cost of capital, the pre tax cost of debt, at to which the cash flows have to be discounted, is missing. So what you are going to do, you will be calculating in IRR. You are going to select any two discounting factors of your choice in order to apply the formula of IRR. Students, what is the formula of IRR? IRR is equal to lower rate of interest, is it? Students, have you forgotten or are you not revising? No, Mr. Formula is just long. <laughs> So lower rate of interest plus NPV and lower rate of interest divided by NPV at lower rate of interest minus NPV at higher rate of interest into H minus L. So if you do have your notes with you, you can just confirm the formula from here and you can have a look at that. And if you want to do this question by yourself in order to calculate IRR, you are most welcome to do that. Do you want to apply the formula of this question by yourself? Take any two discount rates. Which two discount rates do you want? Take 7% and 12%. Any, any two discount rates of your choice you can take to discount the cash flows. Adam, tell me which two you want to take. Sorry? Which two discount rates do you want to select in order to calculate IRR? Uh, I'll uh, consider 10% and 15%. 15% and? 10%. Okay. Now we have to discount our cash flows for both of these rates. First, we are going to write the market value. What is the market value, students? As you can see, they have already written it. 107.5 Because already it's at year zero, so it will remain the same. 107.59. Is it? Yes. Therefore, year one to five, you do have interest payments. How much interest is there? 12. 12%. Yes, 12% 12, 12 means it's 12 for every year. So now students find the MAT factor. For 15% at year 5, how much it is? 3.352. Together you can do for 20% as well. Okay? So that together we can finish our calculations. See the uh, enmity factor at 
twenty percent for year five. How much it is? It's two point nine nine one. Two point two nine one. Two point nine nine one. Sorry. Two point double nine one. Two point double nine one. You must be sure, otherwise our calculations are going to be wrong. Okay. So market value in twenty five, twenty percent is also going to remain the same. One zero seven point five nine. Now discount it. Twelve multiplied by three point three five two. How much it is? Let me do it also. Twelve multiplied by three point three five two. It's forty point forty point two two four. And twelve multiplied by two point double nine one. It's thirty five point thirty five point eight nine two. Now at year five, the amount is going to be redeemed. Redemption amount is how much? It is going to be redeemed at five hundred. So at fifteen percent, what is the present value factor at the year five? I repeat, fifteen percent present value factor at year five. Point four nine seven. Zero point four nine seven multiplied by hundred. Forty nine point seven. So now see the present value factor at twenty percent for five year for fifth year. How much it is? 20% sorry for 20% yes for 20% present value factor at year 5 uh, 0.402 0 0.402 so 0 0.402 multiply by 100 it's 40.2 now students we are going to see the present value at both these rates so it will be let me just do for 15% first 40.24 Plus forty nine point seven minus one zero seven point five nine. So it's in negative negative seventeen point six six six. Or I can take seventeen point six seven. So now I will be calculating the NBV at twenty percent. How much it is? Thirty five point eight nine two plus forty point two. Minus one zero seven point five nine. It is again negative thirty one point four nine eight. Now students put the amounts in the formula. What is your lower rate of interest? It's fifteen percent plus NPV at lower rate of interest. It's a negative. How much it is? Minus seventeen point six seven divided by again. NPV at lower rate of interest that is seventeen point six seven minus NPV at higher rate of interest. How much it has been thirty one point four nine eight. So minus into minus will become plus. Okay. Then higher rate of interest twenty minus lower rate of interest fifteen. Start calculating. Ten point six. Ten point. Ten point six. Ten point six percent. After did you get the same? Uh, still, I'm working on it. Okay. So ten point six percent pre-tax cost of debt means that at this particular point, the NPV of the project is going to become zero. And this is the return which is required by the debt providers, 10.6%. So at 10.6, if you are going to round it, you can round it also. And when you are going to discount the cash flows, you will be getting the 
एन वी वी एफ एस सी ओ ये साथ तक डिड यू गेट द सेम यस ओके ग्रेट नाउ स्टूडेंट्स लेट्स एक्सटेंड आवर डिस्कशन फॉर रिडीमेबल डेट now this is about four steps cost of debt so only one thing you are going to change over here that is you are going to incorporate the taxation factor in your calculations other than that all the things are going to be the same very easy there is a question uh after this the day call by today okay so my dear students let's read it first and then we are going to do the understanding number 14 the question we are going to do later let's read the discussion first if it is the post tax cost of debt to the company that is required that is for a vat calculation and irr still calculated but as the interest payments are tax deductible the irr calculation is based on the following cash flows so only one difference we are going to make that is the incorporation of taxation rate in our interest payments so as you can see market value will be taken in the same way then we are going to take the interest payments by including the tax in the tax in it and then we are going to see the capital repayment that is uh, the principal amount to be retained now let's do this understanding number 14 what is the cost of debt to the company that is post tax cost of debt now students they are again asking us to calculate the cost of debt to the company again we are required to calculate it but now in our calculations we are going to include the tax also so it is going to be done in the same way as you done as you have done the previous question you have taken two discount rates in order to calculate irr 15% and 20% you can do the same calculations only you are going to change the cash flows regarding interest what are going to be the changes in cash flows regarding interest instead of taking 12 you are going to incorporate taxation rate in it what it will become 12 into 1 minus 0.3 what is the corporation tax rate 30% so interest payments will become how much 12 into 0.7 instead of taking interest payments as 12 you are going to take them 8.4 so we are not going to do all of the question we are going to simply change the interest payments for 15% and 20% both you can see the recording now okay because you have missed okay now we are going to calculate the present value of this interest payment other than that all the things are going to remain the student after and uh, as if i hope that you have written it all right so 8.4 now is going to be discounted at 3.352 it will become 28.1568 is it 28. Minus twenty nine point seven 
Double three two. Sorry. Please ask. Okay. NPV at lower rate of interest minus twenty nine point seven double three two. Minus NPV at higher rate of interest is again in negative forty two point two six five. And then we are going to multiply H minus L. So it's twenty minus fifteen. So now calculate it, students, and tell me. Then. Okay, okay, it's okay. The teacher can find you that. The song I did, I'll just find it. Yes, I did that. Fortunately. Uh, Asha, this one is for you. Yes, we are going to use it. I've sent it in the group question. These contents are the same. First, you are going to be You are going to be the question. You are going to find the same. Yes, Atif and Ashika, are you getting the point? And tell me what is the post tax cost of debt? Is it six point nine four? Six point eight six. Six point eight six. Okay. Six point eight six. Students, did you get the same as the guy in Hashir? So this is the post tax cost of this. So the only difference which it is going to be having for pre tax and post tax cost of debt will be the incorporation of tax rate. I hope that everyone is clear. Now we are going to discuss about the estimation of the cost of redeemable debt at current market price. So we can, with the help of the calculations, we have proved that the debt is redeemable at its current market price. So we can say that pre-tax cost of debt is equal to I over MV. I over MV, whereas the post-tax cost of debt is equal to I into one minus T divided by market value. Now, students, we are going to learn the another concept regarding estimation of the cost of convertible debt. What is a convertible debt? Let's listen to me carefully. A convertible debt is the type of a debt which is having an opportunity to be converted into the other type of the marketable security. When we are going to issue, when being a company, when we are going to issue this kind of a debt, it means that we are giving the capacity to the investor that at the end of the particular time period, the investor can convert that amount of debt into the other marketable securities, especially shares. So companies are going to give the opportunity to the investor that at the end of the particular period, they can, instead of getting their amount as redemption, they can convert their amount into the shares. They can purchase the shares of the company. So in this case, the investor will be having two options. Either he or she can get the redemption amount or can convert the amount of debt into the shares, into the predetermined number of shares. So let's see what your slide says about this. Convertible debt, a form of loan to put that allows the investor to choose between taking the redemption proceeds or converting the non loan into the preset number of shares. So in case of convertible debt, my dear students, you have to consider that whether an investor can get the redemption amount or will be getting the predetermined number of shares at the date of redemption. So in your exam questions, both of these situations will be given to you. When they will be trying to test you on convertible debt, they will be giving you the data related both the options for cash redemption and for conversion option as well. You are going to choose the one with the higher value. 
And since they will be uh, trying to check you on the convertible debt, that is why you will always find the conversion option as more lucrative one. So for conversion option, you will be getting the higher amount. So you are going to choose that and then you will be required to calculate the cost of convertible debt. So let's see, they say the key point to calculate the cost of convertible debt, you should calculate the value of conversion option using the available data, then compare the conversion option with the cash option. Assume all investors will choose the option with the higher value. So whichever is going to give you the higher value, you are going to select that one. And specifically in the case of convertible debt, you are going to get the value of the conversion as the higher. Then what you are required to do, you will be required to calculate the IRR of the flows as for redeemable debt because IRR is the cost of debt at which the NPV of the project is zero. So note, there is no tax effect, whichever option is used at conversion date. So taxation is not going to be included. So interest payments are going to be calculated by excluding the factor of taxation now. Now let's do this understanding number 15. The requirement of the question is find the post tax cost of the convertible debt to the company. So now students, you are required to calculate the post tax cost of convertible debt to the company. Uh, all the other things are going to remain the same. You will simply be required to calculate the IRR as we have done in the previous question as well. But you are going to compare the both of the options first, cash option and conversion option. Whichever is higher, you are going to select that. So let's read the scenario. A company has issued convertible loan notes which are due to be redeemed at 5% premium in five years' time. So students, if they are going to be redeemed at 5% premium, what does that mean? They are issued at 100 right now. 100 plus 5, very good. So what, what, what is going to be the premium in this? 1.05. So it will become 105. So what is the cash option? Simply you are going to be getting 105. This is the cash option. The coupon rate is 8% and the current market value is $85. Alternatively, the investor can choose to convert each loan note into 20 shares in the five years time. So what is an alternative option for the investor that instead of getting the cash back at the premium amount, he or she can get the 20 shares uh, in the five years time. They also say the company pays tax at 30% per annum. The company's shares are currently worth $4. Current worth is $4 and their value is expected to grow at a rate of 7% per annum. So after, uh, after five years, the amount is going to be, uh, you know, grown. So, oh right? Yes. So they don't have to every year. So. Yes, after every year. After five years, there will be grow, growth in amount. So right now it is four. After uh, five years, how much it will be? 1.07. Raised to the power five. Is it? How much it is? And they will be getting 20. Five, one, six. Multiply by 20. One, one, two, one, two, zero. One, one, two, point, two, zero. So this is the conversion option. So which option is more lucrative? conversion option. So they are going to select the conversion option. Now what you are required to do, find the most tax cost of the convertible debt to the company. Now simply do the calculations in order to calculate the IRR. Start with you. Take any two discounting rates. I think this is not joining. It is telling that we can do. He's coming to the class because he's telling that I'm not getting the concept, so he's got it. <laughs> okay.
Let's do it together, Harsha, so that the previous concepts are also going to be okay? It will be a revision. Okay, so which two discounting factors do you want to select, students? 8%. Sorry? 8% and 10%. Okay. 8% and 10% we are going to select. Okay, at year zero, what is the market value? 85 is the market value. It is going to remain the same. Since discounting factor is one, it is going to remain the same. For 10% also, we are going to do the calculations, okay? And so now we have taken 8% and 10%. Now, from year one to how many years are there? Five years. From year one to five, we have interest payments, is it? And these are post tax. How much it will be? How much interest is there? Eight. And one minus corporation taxes, 30%. So how much it is? 8 into 0. 0.7? 5.6. 5.6. Now take the enmity factor at 8% for year 5. What is the enmity factor? Asha, do you have a table? Yeah, sure. Okay. See the enmity factor at 8% for year 5? Uh, 0. 0. 0.99. 3. Point? 993. 993. So 3.993 multiplied by 5.6. How much it is? 22.36. 22.36. Okay, now see the enmity factor for 10% at year 5. 3.791. 3.791 multiplied by 5.6. Okay, at the end of the year 5, we are going to get the capital repayment. How much it is? Conversion option has been double one two point two. So, see the present value at 8% for U5? 5% value is 0 0.681. 0.681. See the present value at 5, 5th year for 10%? 0 0.621. 0 0.621. Okay, students. Now for 8%, 0 0.681 multiplied by double one two point two. Seventy-six point four. Okay, and zero point six two one multiplied by double one two point two. Sorry. Sixty-nine point seven. Calculate the NPV for both of the options. For eight percent, it is twenty-two point three six plus seventy-six point four minus eighty-five. It's positive thirteen point seven six. Is it? Then for 10%, 21.26 plus 69.7 minus 85, 5.926. Is it? Yes, Both are positive. Now apply the formula of IRR. Ashwin, what is that? Uh, L plus. Very L good. L plus. N of L. N of L divided by NL minus NH. Very good. So now we are going to put the values. Lower rate of interest is 8. NPV and lower rate of interest is 13.76 divided by 13.76 minus NPV at higher rate of interest, 5.926 into higher rate of interest, 10 minus lower rate of interest, 8. 
calculate it students Eleven point five percent. Eleven point five percent. Asha, did you get the same? Eleven point five percent. So this is IRR. Basically, this is the post-tax cost of the convertible debt to the company. This is a tough day for Atis. Eleven point five percent. When is he going to come and he will rejoin? It's not far on. It is not far. Yes, he he told the message. Okay, anyhow. So, Ashley, are you clear? Yes, miss. Yes, miss, I understood. Okay, this chapter is very important. Actually, uh, cost of capital chapter is very important. You can expect one full-fledged question regarding weighted average cost of capital. Okay, one by one, we are calculating the cost of debt and equity. And in the exam question, they will be giving you the elaborated question to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So you need to be clear about each and every concept. You cannot do the revision kit questions if you are not clear about the uh, concepts in the group. Uh, in the sorry, in the book. Okay, so make sure that you are clear step by step about every concept. Now, students, we will be moving on. Hashir, is it fine? Yeah. Okay. Now, students, we will be learning to calculate the cost of non-tradable debt. What is the non-tradable debt that will not be traded in the stock exchange? So they say bank and other non-tradable fixed interest loans simply needs to be adjusted for tax relief. So cost of the company will be post-tax, that is interest rate into one minus T. Alternatively, the cost of any normal traded company debt could be used instead. So this is a simple question there. Any kind of non-tradable debt, what will be the cost of that loan? It will be post-tax, that was going to incorporate the taxation rate in it. So the requirement of the question is that what is the post-tax cost of the loan? A firm has a fixed rate bank loan of $1 million. $1 million it is, and it is charged 11% per annum. The corporation tax rate is 30%. So 1 million means $100,000. One minus T, one minus taxation rate is 0.3. Is it students? Yes. Okay, so 1 million is not uh, the interest rate, students. Interest rate is 11%. Yeah. Yes, 11% it is. So 11% of 1 million, 10,000. 10, multiplied by 11 divided by 100. Yes, it is. One hundred and ten thousand into point seven, it will be seventy seven thousand. So it is in total, you can take per unit as well simply by taking eleven into one minus point three. Okay. Alternatively, you can simply take 11 into 1 minus 0.3. That will be the post tax cost of the debt. Now let's move on, students. Now we have finished the discussion for individual calculation of the cost of debt and equity finance. Now, in your Companies, obviously, one type of the finance will not be used. 
They will be using some part of the redeemable debt, some part of the convertible debt, some part of the share capital, some part of the preference shares. So hence, they will be using so many different sources of capital. And together for all those capitals, equities, you have to calculate the cost of capital for the company. So for that purpose, you will be required to calculate weighted average cost of capital. You are going to see the average cost of capital for all the finances which are used by the company. That is the total average cost of capital which the company is bearing in order to collect the finance in the company. So they say the general approach is to calculate the cost of each individual source of medium to long-term finance and then weight it according to its importance in the financing mix. This average is known as the weighted average cost of capital. Now, my dear students, in order to calculate the weighted average cost of capital for the company, step number one is to see that which different sources of finance are being used by the company. Then you have to calculate their individual cost for the company. Then you have to see their weightage, their proportion, which is being used in the company. And then in the last, you will be required to calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Now, obviously, when we do have to see the weights, there are certain things which you need to keep in mind. So to calculate weights, when using market values to weight the source of finance, you should use the following calculation. For equity, market value of each year multiplied by number of shares in issue. And for debt, it is total nominal value divided by 100 multiplied by current market value. Even if you are not remembering these formulas, you will be easily able to calculate the weights as it's just by common sense. So they will be giving you enough data in the exam to calculate the weights. So to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, as I have considered, they have told you the steps to be incorporated. The first step is to calculate the weight for each source of capital, then estimate the cost of each source of capital then multiply the proportion of total of each source of capital by the cost of that source of capital. Then sum the results of step three to give the value. All of the above can be summarized in the following formula, which is provided for you in the exam. So in order to calculate weighted average cost of capital, you will be applying this formula. So step by step, we are going to see then how can we apply this formula. Here is understanding number 17, students. There are two requirements of the question. Calculate the weighted average cost of capital using market values. Calculate the weighted average cost of capital using the book values and comment on the difference to your answer from part one. So students, what is the step number one? What we have discussed, calculate the weights for the source of capital. Understanding number 17, which company has 1 million of the law notes in issue? So the first type of, or first source of loan is law notes. Quoted at $50 per $100 of nominal value. Book value also $50 per $100. Then 625,000 preference shares. The second source of finance is preference shares. 625,000 students be, uh, you know, be focused on this thing. Sometimes they are not giving us value for the number of certain marketable securities. So please focus on this point. Sometimes the students do make this uh, side, you know, they, they are not focused and they do make these type of mistakes and their whole question becomes wrong. So over here, they are giving us the number of preference years, 625,000 preference years quoted at 40 cents and the book value is 30 cents per share. And then 5 million ordinary shares. The third type of finance is ordinary shares quoted at 25 cents and their book value is 20 cents per share. The cost of capital of these securities is 9%, 12%, and 18% respectively. This capital structure is to be maintained. The students now, first we are going to calculate the weights. Using the market values, we are going to do it. Is it students? Yes. So 
So which type of securities we are having? The first one is loan notes. So what is the value of loan notes, students? One million and their market value. One million means 10, 100, 1000. Multiply by the market value and the book value are both 50 per 100. So 1 million multiplied by 50 divided by 100. It is $50,000. Multiply by 50 divided by 100, it is? Okay, sorry. 10, 100,000 multiplied by 50 divided by 100. Yes, it is 500,000. Thank you, Marshall. 500,000 is the value. Then, my dear students, the second type of fee security is preference shares. Is it? Yes. How much are the preference shares? 625,000. 625,000 divided by, with, with this thing we do have to divide them. We can remember the formula. Divide. Divided by book value, multiply by? Yeah. Divide by 13. Yes, divided by 0. 0.3. Yes, one, one, three, three. No, you are right. Yes, actually, my calculator was not right. Six twenty-five thousand. No, this is uh, the number of shares already given. Yeah. So yes, six hundred twenty-five thousand multiplied by four in order to convert them into the. We do not need to divide them with the book value since. The value is not given, only number of shares are given. So 625,000 multiplied by 0.4, it will be giving us the total value that is 250,000. This is the value of the preference shares, market value. Okay, and the third type kind of the security is ordinary shares. How much are the ordinary shares? 5 million ordinary shares and they are quoted at 25 cents. So 500,000. 1.25 multiply by 0.25 1, 2, 5, 0, triple 0. 1, 2, 5, 0, triple 0. Please make sure that you are cleared up to here because the next step is new for us. Are you cleared up to here? Now we have to calculate the weightage. How much is the total value of all these? We are going to add them up. So the total is 20 million, is it? Sorry, 2 million, 2 million. Got it? Now we are going to calculate their weights or proportions. Okay, so calculate them. First for loan notes, 500,000 divided by 2 million. 25% or 0.25. Then for preference shares, 250,000 divided by 2 million, 0.125. Is it? Yes. Then the last one, ordinary shares, 1250, triple zero, divided by 2000. Thousand, it's zero point six two five. If you are going to add them up, it's total as hundred percent. Okay, so it will be one. Good afternoon, Nadeep. I I think that you have wasted a lot of time today. I was really worried. So okay, what you can do, you can take some extra time from in order to cover today's lecture because I am sure that you will not be getting it. It's almost covered and we have finished the important part of VAB as well. Okay, now you can take one extra class for me in order to get this concept. Okay, and tell me honestly, you are not revising the previous things. Okay. Is it? Yes. So, okay, let me just revise the concept of VAP. We have just started VAP. Okay, what is weighted average cost of capital since the companies will not be using only one source of finance? 
they will be using multiple sources of finance they will be taking some amount of money by issuing ordinary shares by issuing preference shares by issuing loan notes convertible debts etc so they have to calculate the average cost of capital which they are bearing so in order to calculate weighted average cost of capital we have to see that which different sources of finance are being used in this question three sources of finance were being used we have to take their market values so we have converted them into the market values and now we have taken the weights so simply we have taken the weights 500000 divided by 2 million 250000 divided by 2 million 125000 divided by 2 million okay read the scenario i'm giving some you some time okay to get it Are you clear that how we have converted it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure, sure about all these things. Now the next step is to calculate the weighted cost. What is the weighted average cost of capital? So you can see that the individual cost of capital they have also given. I have highlighted the cost of capital of these securities is nine percent. Then we have twelve percent, and then we have eighteen percent. Now calculate the weighted cost. This one the multiply by this one. This one multiply by this one, okay? Calculated weighted cost. Zero point zero nine multiply by zero point two five. Yes, two point two five percent. Okay, two point two five percent. Yes, for this one. If 1.5 percent, is it? Please make me correct if I'm doing anything wrong. Okay, then 18 percent multiply by. It's 11.25. Got it. Now, like this, we are going to calculate the weighted cost for all three sources of finance. Now, what is weighted cost? We are going to add all of this. That is the weighted average cost of capital. Eleven point two five plus one point five plus two point two five. It is fifteen percent. This is the weighted average cost of capital for the company. Finished. Because I feel we have finished the chapter. No, we have few discussions. Uh, other before you were not there in the class, this particular cost of capital area is very important for the exam. You can expect one full question regarding weighted average cost of capital, and they will be testing you about all the concepts in this portion of cost of capital. Okay, now let's move on, students. Estimating the cost of capital. Now we have calculated the weighted average cost of capital. What is basically weighted average cost of capital? It is the required rate of return. Whenever the company is going to be investing in any kind of the project, they will be requiring this return. Why do we calculate the weighted average cost of capital students? What do you think? Whenever the company is going to invest in any project, they will be requiring this amount of return. But how the return is being established? Why the persons, why the investors do, uh, you know, they, they do discount their incomes at this particular rate? Why is it so? Due to the inflationary element. Due to the inflation. inflationary element. Or we can take due to the risks which they are going to take. They do require the return which is adjusted by the by the uh, risks which they are going to face in that particular investment project. So that weighted average cost of capital is actually establishing the amount of risk which the persons, which the companies are going to take in any kind of the project. But you must also know that the risk for every project is not the same. 
The risk for every project is not the same. It is not going to remain the same. It is going to be dependent upon two types of risks. One is systematic risk and one, one is unsystematic risk. Unsystematic risk is basically the particular risk which is belonging to the particular industry in which the company is making an investment. And that will be changed. Whenever the industry is going to be changed, that unsystematic risk is also going to be changed. The other one is systematic risk. And that is the market risk that is general for every company. That is not going to be changed. The systematic risk is going to remain the same, but unsystematic risk is going to be different whenever the industry in which the investment is being made is going to be changed. So weighted average cost of capital is suitable when the companies are making the same types of investments in the same types of industries and nothing is being changed, everything is constant. But when the diversification is there, when in more than one industry, the portfolio is being made in order to reduce the risk, then obviously weighted average cost of capital is not going to be the suitable one. So that is why what they are telling over here, they are telling us when to use the weighted average cost of capital. The web calculation is based upon the firm's current cost of equity and debt. It is therefore appropriate for use in investment appraisal provided the historic proportions of debt and equity are not to be changed. You know, the gearing of the company is also one of the major risk. The more the debt is going to be there, the more risk can be there, according to some theories. According to some theory, it is not going to bring any difference. So obviously, the company in which the particular companies thinking to invest, if it is also having the same gearing ratio, then weighted average cost of capital can be used. But if the other company in which the investment has to be made, the gearing ratio is different, their debt to equity ratio is different, it means that the risk is now going to be changed. So we cannot uh, discount our cash flows at the back then. Then the operating risk of the firm will not be changed. So when the VAC can be used, when the operating risk in the particular company in which we are thinking to invest is going to remain the same, then the finance is not project specific. That is the projects are financed from the pool of funds or the project is small in relation to the company. So any changes are insignificant. So when the projects are not involving the higher amounts, that is why in those projects, we can take the back in order to discount our cash flows since we are not going to get so many, uh, you know, downfall in the results. Then in any of these criteria, it is not meant, it will not be appropriate to appraise the project using the historic web. So why would we not be able to use the weighted average cost of capital in order to discount the cash flows of for any project under consideration when the risk attached to that particular project is not the same as of the company? So what is the impact of the risk? Let's see. That is again the same which I have discussed with you regarding systematic and unsystematic risk. They say the DVM, dividend valuation model, and where weighted average cost of capital calculations above is you that an investor's current required return will remain unchanged for future projects. But for projects with different risk profiles, this assumption may not hold true. Why this is not going to be true? Because obviously the operating uh, risk or the financial risk or the gearing risk, everything can be changed. They say, we therefore need a way to reflect any potential increase in risk in our estimate of the cost of finance. So they say that one risk, one return which we are getting is for the risk-free investments. What are the risk-free investments? These are the investments which are, or these are the you know loan notes which are provided to us by the banks. When we do invest in the bank, there is zero risk. Is it? When you are investing in a bank, there is minimum risk attached to that because you are sure that the amounts of the principal or the interest are going to be given to you in continuity. So that one is risk-free investment. So one premium which you are going to get will be the risk-free premium plus together with the extra risk which you are taking. If someone is going to invest in the company, obviously the person is taking higher risk as compared to the investment in the bank. So your total return which you are going to get will be the mix of risk-free return 
one you are getting from the the one rate which you are getting from the banks plus the rate of return which is which has to be given to you for taking extra risk by investing in that company so weighted average cost of capital will be used when the risk is same you are not taking any extra risk and tvm is also going to be used in that situation but if you are taking extra risk obviously extra risk premium has to be given to you so it will be the mix of risk free rate plus extra risk premium which you are taking by investing in the company so we have already said that the total return demanded by investor is actually dependent upon two specific factors what are those the prevailing risk free rate of return the reward investors demand for the risk they take in advancing funds to the fund so students look if you say for example the bank interest rate the interest rate which is provided by bank in your country is maybe 8% that is the risk free rate of return so this one is going to be required by any investor it is a minimum rate of return which every investor is going to be requiring plus investors will be requiring extra premium for the extra risk which they are going to take by investing in your company so total obviously total cost total return will be the mix of these two things this is what they are telling in these two points look at each of these and how they relate to different sources of finance what is risk free rate of return let's see what they say the risk free rate of return is the minimum rate required by all investors for an investment whose returns are certain so this risk free rate is for the investments which are very certain to be made it is given in the questions as the return on treasury bills or the return on government gifts return on risky investments loan notes a risk free investment has a certain return although not risk free loan notes are the lower risk investments than equities because the return is more predictable so we have discussed this point earlier as well that debts are more secure as compared to the equities this is because interest is a legal commitment interest will be paid before any dividends loan is often secured if the company issue loan notes the returns needed to attract investors will be higher than risk free rate of return lower than return on equities so the level of risk faced by equity investor depend upon volatility of the company's earnings extent of the other binding financial commitments given the link to the volatility of the company earnings it is these investors that will face more risk if the company was to embark on riskier projects if we want to assess the impact of any potential increases or decreases in risk on our estimate of the cost of finance we must focus on the impact on the cost of equity so the return required by the equity investors can be shown as risk free rate of return plus risk free for extra risk which they are going to take in the uh, by investing in the company so now here they are discussing about systematic and unsystematic risk why the risk is going to be changed for every company in different different companies are in front of you maybe belonging to different industries or to the same industry if all of them are belonging to the same industry then only the risk under consideration will be which one gearing risk their gearing will be different from each other otherwise every company will be dealing with these two types of the risk unsystematic risk and systematic risk my dear students unsystematic risk is always related to the particular company to which you are dealing with systematic risk is the general market risk which is going to be the same for everyone so systematic risk is same for everyone but unsystematic risk is the unique risk which every company or every industry is dealing with so you can consider unsystematic risk is the industry related risk particular specific industry related risk that is the unique risk and systematic risk is the market risk which is same for the everyone say for example if the government is increasing the interest rates that is the systematic risk it is going to uh, affect all of the companies in the particular country at once at the same level or say for example on the other hand if the company is giving some tax relief to the particular industry 
or maybe imposing some more uh, more taxes or more duties on the particular industry, then it will be an unsystematic risk. So unsystematic risk is the unique risk which is related to the particular industry, whereas systematic risk is the same type of risk which is going to affect all the companies in the market at the same level. Now, my dear students, in this particular diagram, what we are trying to show, let's read this uh, here it goes and then we are going to discuss. An investor knowing that the particular investment was risky could decide to reduce the overall risk faced by acquiring a second share with a different risk profile and so obtain a smoother average return. My dear students, every investor does know that investing all of the funds in one particular security is risky thing. So what they do, instead of investing only in one company or only in one project, they do diversify. They do diversify their investment portfolio. They do are going to divide their investment into different companies or different industries. The reducing of risk in this way is known as diversification. As the portfolio risk, as the portfolio increases, the risk reduction slows and eventually stops altogether once 15 to 20 carefully selected investments have been combined. So my dear students, by diversification, the risk can be reduced, but after reaching a certain point, it is going to start remaining constant because it is only unsystematic risk which can be reduced by diversification. Systematic risk is same for all of the companies in the market. That is why the risk cannot be reduced below to this point. So I hope that you are cleared about systematic and unsystematic risk students. Now, from this understanding, you have to tell me that which one are the unsystematic risks and what are systematic risks. Are the sources of systematic or unsystematic risks? The following factors have impacted the volatility of the earnings of chocolate company, a manufacturer of chocolate biscuits and cereals. Increase in interest rates. Is it market risk or is it a unique risk for the industry? Market. Sorry? Market. market risk. So market risk is which risk? Systematic risk. Yeah. Okay. The general risk. No, here the market risk is the systematic risk. So this one is systematic risk, which is the general one for all the companies. Okay. Okay, then increasing the prices of cho cho uh, cocoa beans. This is unsystematic. This is unique risk for this particular industry. So this is unsystematic risk. The legislation changing the rules of tax relief for investments in non-current assets. This is systematic risk. Nothing to be related to this chocolate company. Okay, then growth in the economy of the country where chocolate company is based. Systematic risk because this is Still systematic, it's growth in the economy. Systematic. Okay, then government advice on the importance of eating fruit first. Unsystematic because this is going to affect the uh, you know chocolate biscuits and cereals. Unsystematic. Okay, then industrial unrest in chocolate company made factory. It's again a unique risk. So this is unsystematic This can come in the multiple choice question or anything like that. So unsystematic risk is the unique risk related to the industry in which you are making an investment in systematic risk. What happened? Do you want to pray? Yes. Half an hour, 35 minutes late. You were. You? I came on 3.27. Then when you entered the class straight away, I looked at the clock. Good job. Nobody is sincere. Oh, that, that okay. Even I think I think I You have already prayed? Mashallah. You are not Okay. Take ten five to seven minutes. Okay. Is it fine for you? Five minutes straight, we are going to take. Yeah, Mrs. Fine. Okay.
Nothing can be done now or then. Nothing can be done. This is the same thing that I discussed today. Yes. But if the same thing at the end of the period and uh, things go in a different way, like as it was, uh, I was designed for two papers. Like I was planning for two different papers from now, uh, in this number. And when things went great for that motivation and my step down. I can understand. Yes. And I start uh, delaying, 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 and now later. Uh, I have better when I am thinking of things and what I did not get by way. Yes, it's actually yeah. much better. Okay, anyhow, now students, we are going to discuss the concept of cap time. That is, uh, that is going to be used when we are not in a position to use weighted average cost of capital, when we are having different kinds of risks in front of us. So in that case, instead of using weighted average cost of capital or using DVM, dividend valuation model, we are going to be going for cap, cap and that is capital asset pricing model. Okay. Now, as for cap and which two things we are going to be considering that is risk-free return and risk premium. We are on the point that the, return, the investors will be requiring the return for two types of the risk that is systematic risk and that is unsystematic risk. So required rate of return by the investors will become then risk-free return plus risk premium. So risk-free rate of return is the return which the persons are going to require related to the industrial averages. Whatever in the industry, the risk-free rate of return is given, being given from the banks or on the guilt at securities, et cetera, will be the risk-free rate of return. Plus, there will be the specific risk that is unsystematic risk, and this is related to the industries. Uh, specific industries, it will be related, and it will be different for each and every industry. So that is relative level of systematic risk multiplied by market risk premium for the specific investment. So this is not basically the formula of capital. This is not the formula. It is just telling that CAPM is going to consider both of these things. The formula of CAPM is the students. The formula is ERI is equal to RF plus IB ERM minus RF. My dear students, what is ERI over here? This is simply the expected rate of return on the investment is equal to RF is obviously going to be coming from two factors. The first one is RF, that is risk-free rate of return, plus BI, BI is over here, the systematic risk of investment. Multiply by ERM minus RF, ERM over here is the expected average return on the market, minus RF, that is risk-free return. So they also say they are explaining all of the point that ERI, is expected return on investment. RF is the risk-free rate of return. ERF is equal to the expected average return on the market. This is often simply written as RM. And then ERM minus RF is basically for the equity risk premium, sometimes referred to the average market risk premium. And then BI is systematic risk of investment. I compare to the market and therefore amount of the premium needed. What's the like that? No, no, this formula will not be given to you in the exam. That will be given to you in the exam. Okay. Just try to focus on the basics of the formula. This is risk free rate of return plus the extra premium which is going to be required by the investors. So now, understanding number 20 is their students. What is the required return of an equity investor in G company? So this is basically for capital. So what is the formula for capital? E? E R M R E R. Uh, and you can say that expect, expected rate of return is equal to which thing? Uh, Risk-free rate of return so plus B that is B I beta into e? e R M. That is why we do differentiate it over by saying it as ERI. Then minus risk-free rate of return. This is the formula for CAP. Okay, they say the current average market return being paid on risky investments is 12%. So which one it is going to be? What is 12% here? That is ERM. That is being paid on the risky investments. 
Okay. That is 12%. Okay. Compared with 5% on treasury bills, this is the minimum interest rate that is 5%, and that is risk free rate of return. Now we have to see BI. G company has a beta of 1.2. So this will be the required return for an equity students as per cap. Sorry. 3.4. 13.4. Then the next question, students. If the return on gifts is currently 5.5% and the average return on the market is 10.5%, what is the beta of B company and what does this tell us about the volatility of B's returns compared to those of the market on average? So now students, they are asking us to calculate beta. B company is currently paying a return of 9% on equity in investment. So required rate of return by the company actually which is being paid is 9%. Risk free rate of return is how much? On gains, it is 5.5%. Plus BI, we are required to calculate. RM is again how much students? ERM, return on the market is 10.5. Minus risk free rate is how much? 5.5. So can you calculate BI? 9 minus 5.5 divided by. 10.5 minus 5.5. How much? Yes, yes. 90%. 90 90%. 90%. No. Uh, 0.9. 0.9? The mistake is there. Oh, wow. so zero point seven. Zero point seventeen. Zero point seventeen. Zero point seventeen. Seven. So it will be zero point seventeen seventy percent. It's very, it's very large. Uh, okay, this is this is uh, no. This can cannot be. Ma'am, it's 0 0.7 itself. Yes, oh, yes. 0 0.7 it's already This is beta. So we are not going to convert it into percentage students. This is beta. Okay, now students, on which, which assumptions CAPM is being made? That we are having the well diversified investors which are investing in so many different portfolios. When we have perfect capital market, what is the perfect capital market in which there are no imperfections and everyone is able to invest freely? Then unrestricted borrowing or lending at risk-free rate of interest, everyone is allowed to take the borrowings from the bank. That is the particular characteristic of the perfect market. All forecasts are made in the context of the single period transaction horizon that the forecasts are very much clear. They are not having any doubts in them. That is why they are going to be relating to the single period time horizon. It is important to be aware of these assumptions and the reasons why they can be criticized. Okay, now, why, if, if I to ask you that what can be the basic criticism for capital? Have you ever seen a perfect market? Have you ever seen the situations in which everyone will be able to get the, uh, inter the that uh, loans freely? Have you ever seen the situations in which the forecast is going to be made only for one time period? So these are all assumptions which are not going to be applied in any kind of the market. Every uh, year around the world, we do are we are having imperfect markets, having monopolies, oligopolies, monopolies are there. So there is no such kind like perfect market. So obviously, captain is also not going to be applied. But these are the things which are provided to us by different management theories. So we can apply to them, apply them to some extent in our companies. Now, students, we have entered the chapter understanding number two is there. Risk that cannot be diversified away or can be uh, away can be described as systematic risk. That is the market risk which cannot be reduced by making the diversification in portfolios. Now, understanding number 23, 
Which of the following statements is true? Beta factors measure the systematic risk of the portfolio relevant to the market portfolio. Which of the following statements is true? If beta is lesser than one, the security is less sensitive to the systematic risk than the market average. Is it so? In the previous example, like we have calculated the beta as 0.7, it was lesser than one. What does that actually mean? It means that your portfolio in which you are investing is lesser sensitive to the volatilities, okay? It is not going to bring so much changes. So if beta is lesser than one, the security is less sensitive to the systematic risk than the market average. This is true. If beta is greater than one, the security is less sensitive to the systematic risk than the market average, this is false. If beta is more than one, it means that the security, the investment portfolio is more sensitive to the particular risk as compared to the market average. If beta is equal to one, the security's exposure to systematic risk exactly matches the market average, this is true. If beta is equal to zero, the security is risk-free. Yes, this is also true. So if beta is equal to the one, it means that the security exposure to systematic risk is exactly equal to the market average. And if beta is equal to zero, it means that the security is risk-free. Are you getting how is it so? If beta is equal to zero, if this beta is equal to zero, what are we going to have then? Yeah. Only risk-free rate. Is it? So that is why. This is also true. If beta is equal to one, the security's exposure to systematic risk exactly matches the market average. So statement number two is wrong. One, three, and four are the right ones. Okay, now students understanding number 24 is there. You will be required to calculate the average cost of capital. Again, this one is a detailed one. You can do it from your homeworks. With this, we have ended the chapter, students. You do not need to consult the book for this chapter. Everything was, has been included, okay? So now we are going to start the next chapter that is capital structure. All of the theory is included in this chapter. Nothing, only one numerical or two numericals may be there in this chapter. So all of the theory is included and that theory is again based upon the risk discussion which we have done. In this chapter, we are going to discuss different kinds of theories which are being given in regards to the risk to us. The basic concept is going to remain the same. In this chapter, we are going to discuss about the theory. What is the meaning of theory? Basically, the ratio of debt to the equity in the company. We are going to be discussing about two types of theory, operating theory and financial theory. We are going to discuss the link between company value and the cost of capital. We are going to discuss about different theories related to the risk. We are going to be discussing about choosing the discount rates, in which situations we have to discuss, we have to select where, in which situations we have to select CAPM, and when to use CAPM to find a risk-adjusted discount rate. So we are going to discuss all these things. Students, what is the operating theory? What do you think? The gearing or the risk which is coming to the organization due to the operational factors. What are the operational factors? Operational factors are those which are going to bring up the cost like variable cost and fixed cost in the organization. The more the fixed cost in the organization will be, the more riskier the operations are. So we can say that the proportion of the fixed cost to the variable cost can tell us the operational gearing of the organization. The more higher the answer of the ratio is, the more higher the operational gearing is and more risky the operations are. If the organizations are making more and more sales revenue, even then it will be affected by the fixed cost which it is having in the organization or the operations are going to be decreased, even if the sales revenue is going to be decreased, the fixed costs are going to remain the same. So the more the fixed costs are going to be in the organization, the higher the operational gearing is. So operational gearing is the risk attached to the operational activities of the organization. That is the ratio of fixed cost to the total cost in the organization. So what they say, operating gearing is the measure of the extent to which a firm's operating costs are fixed rather than variable, as this affects the level of business risk in the firm. My dear students, what is the business risk? A risk which is specifically related to the business under consideration. 
And in that business, what is the higher risk? Obviously, the amount of costs which are fixed in the organization. So that is why they say the ratio of the fixed cost to the variable cost or the ratio of the fixed cost to the total cost or changes in earning before interest and tax to the changes in revenue or contribution divided by earning before interest and tax. What is contribution? As every one of us do know, that is sales revenue minus variable cost. So it is also going to tell us the ratio of fixed cost in the overall uh, operational activities of the organization. They say firms with higher proportion of fixed costs and their cost structures are known as high operating gearing. Why is this necessary to be understood by you, my dear students? Because you are particularly going to establish the total risks of different companies. The higher the operational gearing, the higher risk is going to be attached with that firm. And whenever you are going to invest in that particular company, obviously you will be requiring more risk premium. So you need to be attached to the basic point. Why are you going to establish the operational gearing? Because in order to invest those particular companies in which there is higher operational gearing, your risk premium is going to be higher. And please also notice the point which we have discussed earlier that business risk is going to be different for each and every company. If it is going to remain the same, then it's okay. We can use weighted average cost of capital in order to appraise any kind of investment opportunity. These risks are different. Operational gearing or financial gearing is different for every business. So this business risk is going to be different. That is why whatever we are doing, we have to consider the risk premium also. So they say, thus if the sales of the company vary, the greater the operation operating gear, the greater the EBIT variability. The level of operating gearing will be largely a result of the industry in which the firm operates. Okay, then understanding one, operating gearing. What is the level of operating gearing in each and what would be the impact on each of the 10% increase in sales? With the help of this given scenario, can we calculate the uh, operating gearing? What is that? Fixed cost divided by variable cost. You can do any of the formula you can apply. So simply we can do it as fixed cost divided by variable cost. So with the help of this given data, how much it will be? 0 0.33. Okay, so 33%. In this case, 3 divided by 1, it will be? 3 itself. Okay, so... 3%. So what does that basically mean? Which company, which company, which firm is having higher operational gearing? Firm B. It is going to be the higher, it is going to be having the higher volatility. It will be having higher risk premiums attached to it because it is having higher fixed costs as compared to the variable costs. So higher the operational gearing, higher risks are going to be attached to the particular uh, company and we are going to require more risk, more returns from that particular company. Now, if say, for example, we are increasing the sales by 10%, by increase of sales by 10%, what is going to be the effect for both of the firms? It is going to increase? Yes. But what are going to be uh, the case for this one? 5.5. 5. For this case, 10% increase in this? 3.3. For this also, 5.5, it will become 1.1. Is it? What about the fixed cost? Will remain the same? Will remain the same. How much EBIT we are going to get here? 1.2. What about this? Same? No. How is it going to be same? 1.1 it is there. This one is 0.7, 0.7, both 0.7. I mean, mistake is 0.7, 0.7. Are you sure? Yeah, because fixed cost is 3 here. Yes. Just one point four. Zero point nine here. 1.4. No, maybe 1.4. That's what I'm on. 1.4? Yeah. Okay. okay, then what is happening in this case basically? We have increased the operations in the same manner, but over here we have seen the increase of 
20%, but over here we have seen an increase of 40%. Why is it so? Because this firm is more sensitive, more sensitive to the operations. So higher the operational gearing, more sensitivity is going to be there. Cleared? Okay, now students, what is financial gearing? Financial gearing is related to the ratio of debt to the equity being used in the organization. Sure, I, I will search again. Okay, so the more the ratio of debt in the organization, the more higher financial gearing is going to be there. So debt divided by equity is financial gearing. Now, financial gearing is also going to be different for every company. Is it? So financial gearing is going to be changed. That is why again, we cannot use PAC. We have to use CAPM or we have to apply other methods. So what is financial gearing? Financial gearing is the measure of the extent to which debt is used in the capital structure. And one thing you need to be considering over here that preference shares are also going to be treated as debt as for their basic qualities because they are having the qualities of being redeemed. That is why they will be considered as debt in the calculations of financial theory. So when we do calculate the debt to equity ratio, we are taking the preference shares in the debt part. So what can be the formulas which can be used in order to calculate financial theory? Long-term debt plus preference share capital divided by ordinary share capital and reserves or total of capital theory, long-term debt plus Preference share capital divided by total long-term capital. Interest gearing can be debt interest divided by operating profits before debt interest and tax, that is PBIT simply. So in equity gearing, what you are taking as the numerator, numerator is the same as you are going to take in the total or capital gearing, but what is changing basically it is denominator. In the case of equity gearing, you are taking only ordinary share capital, but in the case of capital gearing, that is total gearing, you are taking total long-term capital. Basically over here, what you are going to take? Only equity. But over here, debt plus equity pool. Okay, so this is simple ratios if you do remember for F5 as well. One was debt over equity, one was debt over debt plus equity. So this is the difference. Over here, the third one, if you can see, that is interest gearing. That is debt interest divided by operating profits before interest and tax. So you will be basically seeing that how much of your EBIT, PBIT is covered by the debt interest payment. So that is interest gearing. The more it will be, it means that more riskier the operations are. When you, when your investment, when your total profit before interest and tax is going to be covered more by the debt interest, it means that more riskier the operations are not becoming because before to giving the dividends to the shareholders, the debt interest have to be paid. So when this is going to be the case, the equity investors will be requiring more and more returns from you. So the same in the case of the operating gearing, when financial gearing is also going to be increased, the risk is going to become higher. Now, yes, Jim. In case of uh, interest gearing, yes, uh, preference share dividend will be part of the interest. Sorry, uh, preference share uh, dividend will be part of the interest. Yes, because preference share the dividend which we are paying on the preference shares is always fixed. So when we are considering them as the debts, then the interest which we are dividend which we are paying on them will also be considered as the interest. Okay, that is uh, substance over form. Okay, now students, capital and equity gearing. The requirement of the question is to calculate the equity gearing and capital gearing of the business. What is the formula for equity gearing, students? Debt over equity. What is for the capital gearing? Debt over debt plus equity. Can you please calculate quickly? This is just the calculation. Yes, Sorry? That 50 is 0.47. Sorry? 0.47. 0.47, okay. Mm -hmm. 
Capital gain is 0.32. Yeah. 0.32. Okay, what amount of debt you have taken? Eight. Eight? No notes, 10%. No notes, 10%? Yeah, what about the preference? But the mistake is what we have considered the trade payable. We should not have considered a trade payable. Oh, yes. Wait, no notes are different. It's still there. Eight, that is it. No notes we have considered. No notes, eight percent. Yes. So and what know. about the preferential capital? You we'll know? Take it. We'll take it. You yes. Yeah. So have you taken? Yeah. Like what? Huh? Like what? Oh my God. Like what? Like what? Like what? Like what? No. Okay. Atif is, look, this question is based upon assumption. If you are considering that bank overdraft, everyone knows it's a short term, short term loan. It normally does not, it's going not going to be included in the long term. It's always a current liability. But over here, you can assume it to be your debt. Okay, that it is being taken again and again and is helping you in the long term liability as well. Okay, so you can take so you can take total of this uh, a this eight plus five, and then you have to take this preference your capital as well in the debt. What about this equity? How much equity have you taken? Okay. This is the mistake which you are doing. What? If you have taken this preference to capital in debt, then why are you taking it again in I equity? Then you are telling 17 equity you have taken. Okay, so that, that changes you have to make. Okay, right. Sorry? Adding amounts. Sure, sure. Okay, so this is the number. Right over equity, you are using this formula. The total debt is this one eight okay. plus this bank overdraft five plus, plus preference real capital of one point five. And equity you have to take ten plus three plus two point five. Okay. If you are taking debt over debt plus equity, that is capital gearing, the numerator is going to remain the same. Divided by this numerator, 8 plus 5 plus 1.5 plus this one, 10 plus 3 plus 2.5. Okay, sure. Please keep in mind that this is the this particular topics, including ratios as well, can include your assumptions. So you can exclude overdraft or you can include also. Okay, show the previous slide. Show it to you. What did you want to consider? So. Okay, now students, financial gearing, book or market values. The ratios can be calculated using either book or market values of the debt and equity. So you can use both of them, okay? But there are arguments in favor for both approaches. Market values are more relevant to the level of investments made. It represents the opportunity cost of the investment made. They are consistent with the way investors measure debt and equity. So in the case of all the ratios, my dear students, market values are always up to date. Whereas book values are how imposed gearing restrictions are often expressed, are not subject to sudden change due to the market factors are readily available. What is the impact of the financial gearing? Where two companies have the same level of variability in gearings, the company with the higher financial gearing will have increased variability of the returns to the shareholders. The companies which are having higher financial gearing over your investors will be requiring higher returns. Now, over here, the impact of the financial gearing. Calculate the impact on the form C of 10% fall in sales and comment on your reserves. First, calculate the 10% decrease in reserves. What is it going to be? Sales are going to become how much? 10% decrease? Nine? Yeah. Is it? What about this variable cost? 1.8. Fixed cost? Five. How much is the operating profit? How 12.2? Yes, it can be. 
Oh yeah, she made my. No, sorry, it's my pixel. Yes, how much? Two point two. Two point. Yes, interest. Why interest is going to be decreased? It's ten percent fall in sales only. Oh. So interest is going to remain the same. It will be zero point two. Now, what is the impact? Calculate the impact on the form C of the 10% fall in sales and comment on your results. What has happened actually? By decreasing the sales, what has happened? The profit before taxation has been decreased by how much? Almost 80%. It has been increased. It has been decreased. Why is it so? You have decreased your sales only by 10%. But the decrease in profit before taxation is how much? 80%. Why is it so? Because the financial gearing has been like this. There will be more financial gearing. The debt to equity ratio has been more. That is why the company has been more volatile and there will be a more variability in the results. So the higher the financial gearing is, the more variability in the returns are going to be there. And hence the returns which are required by the shareholders are going to be increased. The same like operating gearing, when there is an increase in the financial gearing, you will be having more variability in the returns and the investors will be requiring higher returns. Now, the discussion is starting now. The total risk which is attached to any company is the mix of business risk, operating gearing, and financial gearing. The total business risk which any company is going to have will be dependent upon its operational activities and about the sources of finance which it is using. So there must be a balance and there can be a trade-off in between the risks as well. Okay, so this is what you need to do. Now, what is the company value and the cost of capital and what can be the optimal cost capital structure? Students, what do you think that if the debt is going to increase in the company, is it going to be favorable for the companies? Why? Why is it not going to be favorable? It is, a, it is going to be, it is going to have the less cost of capital for the company. So it is favorable. Is it? Situation. Situation? Okay. Uh, when, when if we are taking uh, debt, I mean, uh, lower prices for, for debt, then we can. Yes. Can, and equity, if yes. Uh, okay, so if it is if it is at low cost, then it is going to be decreasing. The cost of capital for the company is going to decrease. But on the other hand, the investors which are investing in the company, if they are going to see that there are more and more debts in the company, no. the financial gearing is more, they will be increasing their returns. Am I right? So it is going to be balanced. So it means that we have mix of thinking. Someone, some says that when we are going to increase the gearing, it is beneficial. Some says that no, when the, it is going to be increased, obviously the investors are going to require higher rate of returns. So it is going to be balanced, is it? So that is what we are asking that what would be the optimal capital structure? From which different sources of finance the company should be raising finance, whether all from debt, whether all from equity, what should be done? So in that regard, we do have different theories. Then the objective of the management is to maximize shareholders wealth. Financial managers will always be stick to this point that the objective of financial management or any company is to maximize the shareholders wealth. And if it could be achieved by reducing financial gearing, or by reducing operational gearing, it has to be done. So if altering the gearing ratio could increase wealth, then finance managers would have a duty to do so. Is it possible to increase shareholders' wealth by changing the gearing ratio level? Is it so? If you are increasing or decreasing the debt to equity ratio, is it going to affect the shareholders' wealth? This is the answer. The answer to the question is what we were discussing. If we are increasing the debt in the company, the weighted average cost of capital can be reduced or it can stay constant or it can increase as well. If it is not having, if it is not taking any effect by increasing the gearing, then it is going to be equal. If it is taking an effect, then what is going to happen? 
cost of equity is going to increase after certain point. You, before to certain point, the weighted average cost of capital is going to reduce by increasing gearing. But once the gearing is going to reach a particular limit, even the investors will be requiring higher rate of return. So weighted average cost of capital will start increasing. So what can we do? We have to select the optimal capital structure at which the shareholders' wealth can be to can lead to the maximum. If company distributes all its earnings, it follows that the total market value of the company equates to the present value of the future cash flows available to the investor. If the company is distributing all of its earnings, then what happens? The total market value of the company is equal to the present value of its future dividends. What, what, is the, what is the return for the investors? It's dividend. So if it is, if it is distributing all of its earnings as the dividend, then the market, current market value of the company must be equal to the present value of all the dividends which it is going to share. Discounted at the overall required rate of return or back. But which required rate of return must be there because of the passage of time, maybe the gearing ratio or the capital ratio is going to be increased or decreased. So what is the optimal capital structure? What should we have to do? Market value of the company, if we are using the perpetuity formula, if the uh, dividends are never going to be stopped, then the future cash flows divided by VAP is the required rate of return. Can we reduce the VAP by changing the gearing ratio? This is the question. Or the value of the company in simplest form is this. So this is the question to which we do need to find an answer. Now, extending the discussion, by reducing the debt, what can happen? By increasing the debt, what can happen? There are different points of view. If we are going to reduce the amount of debt in the company, then what is going to be the effect? If we are going to reduce the amount of debt in the company, then more equity financing is going to be there. If more equity financing is going to be there, then weighted average cost of capital is going to increase. Is it so? Yeah. If we are increasing the amount of debt in the company, then what is going to happen? Sorry? Equity funding is less. funding is less, okay. Cost of capital also is compared to that. Is less. So, Arthur is of the point that if we are going to reduce the debt financing in the company, then the total debt of the company is going to reduce. So if we are increasing the debt financing in the company, so then what is going to happen? Sorry, Arthur, can you repeat the point? Yeah, and if we are increasing the debt financing, then the cost of capital will be reduced and the cost of uh, debt will be increasing. Cost of equity is going to? Reduce. Cost of equity is going to reduce? But the cost of getting, getting cost getting an increase. Why, why, is it, why is it going to happen? Uh, because uh, we are uh, depending more on the uh, Interest based what, what would be the effect on the weighted average cost of capital? Yes, when we are using more debt, obviously the cost of debt is going to increase and the cost of equity is going to reduce. But what, what will be the effect on the weighted average cost of capital? It will reduce. It will reduce. Why is it going to reduce? I think because of because the cost of debt is cheaper? Uh, no. Yeah, we can say the cost of uh, cost of debt is cheaper to the cost of equity. But what about that point then? That after certain level, when the debt is going to reach at a certain time limit, obviously the investors will be requiring higher rate of return. So it means that there must be a balance. We cannot reduce the interest. We cannot reduce the debt financing in the company, or we cannot increase it as well. If we are going to reduce it, what is going to happen? Increase is the proportion of the cheaper debt finance. Uh, put all other things equal, decrease the value. So when we are going to increase the debt financing, this point is in our mind that VAP is going to reduce because we are using cheaper source of finance. But if we are going to increase it, because if we are taking this point, the more the debt financing, our VAP is going to be reduced. So if we are going to increase it, then what is going to happen? Increasing the proportion of debt finance increases the risk for equity and cost of equity. So with the, uh, all the other things equal increases the VAP. Why it is going to increase the VAP? Because after certain point limit, cost of equity, the investors will be requiring higher rate of return. So there must be a balance in between these. Now, 
debt is cheaper than equity, every one of us do, because it is having lower risk attached to it, and it is going to have the tax relief on the interest as well. Increasing levels of debts make equity more risky. Fixed commitment paid before equity finance risk. So increasing financial gearing increases the cost of equity and that would increase the wealth. So there must be a balance. We cannot increase the debt financing in the company by having the point in our mind that the more the debt is going to be in the company, the more lesser weighted average cost of capital is going to be because this is not always true in every situation. After a certain point, the company's operations are going to become more riskier. It will increase the weighted average cost of capital for the company. So various theories have attempted to answer the question that what should be an optimal capital structure, which has the greater effect on VAC, the reduction in VAC caused by the cheaper debt, the increase in VAC by the increase in the financial risk and cost of equity. So whether we have to increase the debt or we have to reduce it, we have so many theories for this purpose. That is the traditional view of capital structure. This is the first theory which we are going to consider. This is the viewpoint about which I was telling you people that when we are going to increase the gearing in the company, the weighted average cost of capital is going to reduce up to the certain extent. But when the investors of the company are going to feel that now more gearing is in the company, the more riskier operations have become, they will increase their return. When they are going to increase in their return, the cost of equity is going to increase and weighted average cost of equity is also going to be increased. Got it? So this is the traditional view that when you are going to use more and more debt up to a certain extent, it will be beneficial for us. But obviously after that point, it will become not more beneficial for us. It will be bringing some drawbacks for us. So if this is going to be the case, KE is the cost of equity and KD is the cost of debt. What is the conclusion? So what is the optimal, uh, optimal cost structure then? If this is going to be the case, this is the optimal cost structure at which the weighted average cost of capital is the minimum. But how are we going to find this optimal structure? We do not have any other option than the trial and error method. We are going to increase the debt in the company more and more we are going to increase and we are going to wait for the point that at which point the cost of equity for the company is going to increase now. At which point the equity investors have started feeling that the return should be now more. So this is only the trial and error approach. So this is traditional view of capital structure. So what was the stance of the traditional view? When we are going to increase more and more debt, up to a certain extent, the cost of equity is going to reduce and the weighted average cost of capital is also going to reduce. But after reaching a certain limit, the cost of capital is going to increase. Okay, so what is the implication for finance then? Company should gear up until it reaches optimal point and then raise a mix of finance to maintain this level of curing. So before to reaching the optimal point, they can have more and more debt financing. But after reaching a certain point, then you, they should have to uh, use the mix of financing, debt plus equity, okay? What is the problem? There is no method apart from trial and error available to locate the optimal point. So what is the basic problem of this particular theory that we do not have any other option to calculate the optimal point instead of the trial and error. Then we do have Modigliani and Miller method, M and M theory. M and M theory has two parts, one without inclusion of tax and one with tax. One uh, theory of M and M presented by M and M was based on the assumption that there is no tax, which is obviously not going to happen. There is tax in every economy. So first part of this theory is based upon the fact that there is no tax. This theory, in this theory, M and M has told us that the more the gearing is in the company, the more beneficial it is. So the more we are going to increase the gearing, that is what you were discussing in the start. The more debt is going to be there in the company, then there will be more advantage. The weighted average cost of capital is going to become uh, lesser and lesser. 
What happens actually, students, when we are increasing the debt in the company? When we are increasing and increasing the debt in the company, what happens in the start? The operations are not very much risky. So up to the point, up to the certain extent, then the company will be having lesser weighted average cost of capital. So MNM said that every time for whole life of the company, this situation is going to prevail. They have skipped the next point that when the clearing level is going to be reaching a particular point, then the equity investors will start increasing their wishes and the required rate of return by them is going to be increased. So let's see, MNM argued that investors are rational. The required return of equity is directly proportional to the increase in clearing. There is thus a linear relationship between cost of equity and clearing measured at debt to equity. The increase in cost of equity exactly offsets the benefit of the cheaper debt finance, and therefore the VAT remains unchanged. Students, why MNM said that VAT is going to remain unchanged? Unchanged VAT is going to be there. Can you explain this point? The told that VAT is going to remain unchanged. There is no effect on the VAT. Similar point you explained, I think, was at a certain point of time. So that's an equity level. But then the VAC is going to be reduced. The point which I was discussing, at that point, the VAC is going to, uh, VAC, sorry, the more the debt is going to be there after a certain point, VAC is going to increase. Yeah. But they say that VAC is going to remain unchanged because they are adding one discussion over here that increase in cost of equity exactly offsets the benefit of the cheaper debt finance. What is that? With increasing cost of equity, uh, like when it's uh, compared like with the foreign or similar, for example, uh, again, the point is saying like at a certain period of time, uh, the foreign comes on a point where the investor go for a return. Okay. So but then, then VAC is, is going to change after that point. But they say that all the time VAC is going to remain unchanged. And the first point they say the investors are rational. The required return of the equity is directly proportional to the increase in gearing. What does that mean? They don't want to share their profit. Sorry? They are rational in a way that they don't want to share their profit. They are starting to get profit. Okay. And they are instead of sharing their time to. Yes, so they are not ready to share their profits. So when the gearing is going to increase, yes. they will increase their returns. Is this what it means, Harsha? Yes, he is very right, Harsha. So the investors are rational. The required return of equity is directly proportional to the increase in gearing. Thus, there is a linear relationship between cost of equity and gearing. So what is the meaning of this point then? The increase in cost of equity exactly offsets the benefit of the cheaper debt finance. That linear relationship is something mysterious. What is the meaning of linear relationship? When they equal parallel proportion. That is linear relationship. And one thing is increasing, the other thing is also increasing. Mm -hmm. That is a linear relationship. So what are they telling basically? When debt financing is increasing, the cost of equity is also going to increase because Equity here, shareholders are of the point which is going to come after this optimal structure. They do know that when more debt financing is going to be there in the company, the more riskier operations are becoming, and that is why more return they are requiring. So that is what they are telling that they are in that they are rational investors. They do not want their amount of money to be going to the invest to the hands of the debt providers. That is the, the one point you have raised that was accurate. So they do not want their amount of money to be going to the invest to the hands of the debt providers. So what is exactly going to happen? The more the debt is going to be there, the higher is going to be the cost of equity. So it is going to be more. And at one point, the benefit which we are, the company is going to get be getting by lower cost of debt is going to be completely offset by the benefit of the equity. 
uh, by the uh, sorry risk of the equity. It is going to be equal to each other. On one hand, more debt is giving us sorry, more debt is giving us benefit. Is it? And on the other hand, the equity providers are going to increase their cost of equity. So this benefit is going to be directly equal to the increased cost. And that is why our back is going to be equal. It will not be changed. The benefit which the company is getting by more and more debt, by introduction of more and more debt in the company will be offset by the more amount of equity return which is being provided to the equity, equity investors. That is why it is going to be offset and back is going to remain unchanged. So that is what they are telling us in point B, the increase in cost of equity, the increase in cost of equity offsets the benefit of the cheaper debt finance and therefore the back remains unchanged. So this is the assumption which has been taken by MNM with no taxation. What is the conclusion then? The VAC and therefore the value of the firm are unaffected by changes in the gearing levels and gearing is irrelevant. Whatever levels of gearing you want to introduce, you can because VAC is going to remain unchanged. So what is the implication for finance? Choice of finance is irrelevant to shareholders well. Company can use any mix of funds. If they do want to increase gearing, they can. If they do want to have more equity, even then they can have. So Atif, are you clear about the linear relationship? The more the debt is going to be there, the higher the cost of debt, the higher the cost of equity. Okay, now, how can we represent this diagrammatically students? M and M with no taxation, that VAC is going to remain unchanged. It will remain constant. What are the assumptions contributing M and M theory students? That no taxation is there. Again, they are of the concept that there is a perfect capital market. No transaction costs are there and debt is risk-free, which are not applicable in the market. Now, M and M theory, the second part is with an inclusion of taxation. Now, when MNA provided this theory with taxation, they said that more the gearing is in the company, the more beneficial it is. In the previous part, they said that VAC is not going to be changed. Whatever the mix of capital is there, it is irrelevant for the company. But over here, they said that more the gearing in the company, it will be more beneficial for the company. This is their stance. Why? Because with taxation, what is going to happen? The cost of debt for the company is going to reduce with the taxation. So obviously, the more the gearing levels in the company are going to be there, then more beneficial for the company it will. So in 1963, MNN modified their model to reflect the fact that the corporation tax system gives tax relief on interest payments the starting point for this theory is as before that investors are rational. The required return of equity is directly linked to the increase in gearing. As gearing increases, cost of equity increases in direct proportion. That is linear relationship. However, this is adjusted to reflect the fact that debt interest is tax deductible. So overall cost of debt to the company is lower than in m, &M. In the previous part, they have not discussed the part of taxation. So cost of debt in their previous theory has been high. That completely offsets the required rate of return by the investors. But over here, the cost of debt is now less as compared to the previous, uh, as compared to the previous uh, part of your particular uh, theory. So now over here, they are going to, they are including the tax incorporation as well. And they are telling us that the cost of debt is going to become more lesser for the companies. Lower debt cost result in less volatility in returns for the same level of gearing, which leads to lower increases in cost of equity. The increase in cost of equity does not, does not offset the benefit of the cheaper debt finance. Now, they said in the previous part, in the previous theory, what they said, that the benefit by, the, the increase in benefit by using more and more gearing is going to be equal to the higher cost for cost of equity. 
the cost of the more gear, the cost of equity is going to increase. So that is offsetting each other. But when we are including, we are including the taxation in it, then it means that benefit is much higher now. So it is not going to offset the cost of equity. So it means that the more the debt is going to be there, it will be more beneficial for the companies. So what is the conclusion then? Gearing up reduces the value and increases the market value of the company. The optimal capital structure is 99.9% gearing. Got it? So students, what has been the conclusion for traditional view? What did they set in traditional view? What has been the conclusion for VAC? The first one. So what has been the traditional view? The cost of getting in, cost of capital to the same time. No, that was the first part of MM. Yeah. It was that up to a certain extent, the when we are increasing the gearing, the cost of equity is yes. going to, the back is going to reduce. After a certain point, it will start increasing. Okay, so we can have the gearing up to a certain extent. The first part of MMM was, what was the decision for that? What was the conclusion in that? VAC is not going to be changed. So whatever mix of capital we want to have, we can. MMM with tax, what was the, what is the conclusion? The more the gearing is, the more beneficial it will be for the companies. But do you think that it is good for the companies to have high gearing? It is never. Why? Because the companies will be having the bankruptcy risk. The companies will be having higher agency costs. The companies will be reaching a certain point where tax is going to be exhausted and no more benefit can be taken by increasing and increasing debt financing. How much tax the companies have to pay? So how much benefit of this interest, you know, interest one minus T we can take? So tax is going to exhaust the impact on the borrowing debt capacity. Obviously, the securities are going to become lesser. The company's borrowing capacity is going to exhaust also. The difference in risk tolerance levels between shareholders and directors, maybe the directors do want to take more and more risk. They will increase gearing, but shareholders do not want their gearing to be increased. Why? Because the return to them is going to be reduced. Then restrictions in the articles of association. There are two types of documents, major documents of the company's memorandum and articles. So in articles of association, maybe there are restrictions in the borrowing of the company that beyond this limit, we are not going to borrow. Cheer capital and borrowing both are written in the articles of association, their limit. Then increases in the cost of borrow borrowings as gearing increases. So as we have discussed in the traditional view, the gearing after a certain point is going to increase the weighted average cost of capital. So we cannot remain on the stance that whatever level of gearing we want to have, we can. It has to be restricted. So as a result of these market imperfections, despite the theories, gearing levels tend to be based on more practical concerns and company, companies will often follow the industry average gearing. So what is the answer to the question about the optimal capital structure? It should be according to the market average. We cannot have more and more gearing as per our own wish. Now, the last theory in this regard is second order theory. This one is a very irrational theory, we can say. That is, we are going to use the finances in terms of order. First, we are going to use the internally generated funds that are retained earnings. Once they are going to be exhausted, then we are going to use the debt. And once this is going to be exhausted, when we have reached the optimal level, we are going to start issuing the new equity. So in the second order theory, only the order of issuing the finances was necessary. Other than that, nothing was there. Okay, now understanding number four is there, students. Answer the following questions. If a company in a perfect capital market with no taxes, incorporates increasing amount of debt into its capital structure without changing its operating risk, what will be the impact on its rated average cost of capital? No. With no tax. With no tax, it will be a traditional uh, no. way of... No. What are we to say? With no tax, the benefit 
which we are taking by increasing the level of debt is going to be completely offset by the increase of the cost in equity. So VAC is going to remain unchanged, no effect, okay? In the perfect capital, this is the first part of MM. Then according to MM, why will the cost of equity always rise as the company gears up? Because the investors are rational. Investors are rational and there is a linear relationship between the cost of debt and the cost of equity. Then in perfect capital market, with, but with taxes, two companies are identical in all respects, apart from their level of gearing. A has only equity finance, B has 50% debt finance, which firm would be MM argue was worth more with taxes. Form B with debt finance. The more the gearing is, the more market value the company is going to have. Very good. So in practice, a firm which has exhausted retained earnings is likely to select which form of the finance next? According to pecking order theory. The second level is for debt finance. And the third one is So this is the summary of the gearing theories for traditional theory. What has been the optimal finance side and maintain optimal gearing ratio? Where the VAT is going to be the least one, after which VAT is going to increase. And then with no tax, choice of the finance is irrelevant. Whatever source of finance we want to use, we can. With tax, as much debt as possible. The optimal solution has been 99.99% theory. The pecking order theory, in order we have to use the finances, first retained earnings, then debt, and then finally, equity finance. Now, students, use of VAC in investment appraisal. After all the discussion, what do you think? What can we use VAC in the investment appraisal? Yes, this is what we have been discussing. So again and again, they are keeping you on the same point that why don't we use VAC for the investment appraisal? After discussing all the previous things, now again they wanted you to discuss that why can't we use VAC for the investment appraisal? because operational gearing and financial gearing and unsystematic risk are not the same. They will be different. So there will be risk-free premium plus market rate premium as well. So in the chapter covering cost of capital, we learned how to calculate back. It was based upon the firm's current cost of equity and debt, is it? It is based upon company's current cost of equity, current cost of capital. But the company in which you are investing, in which you are thinking to make an investment will not be having the same gearing levels. So that is what they are trying to make you understand. It is therefore appropriate for use in investment appraisal provided the historic proportions of debt and equity are not changed. If you are investing in some company in which the same debt to equity ratio is there, the financial gearing is same, then you can use back. If historic proportions are there, otherwise, no. The operating gearing of the firm will not be changed. So if the operating gear, the ratio to fix to a variable cost are same, then you can use VAC. Otherwise, not. The finance is not project specific. That is projects are financed from the pool of funds or the project is small in relation to the company. So the changes are so insignificant. So again, you need to consider that you are clear about the point because in exam, you must have to discuss this point okay when the question on the back is going to come they are not going to leave you only to the numerical portion you have to discuss all these points when you are going to discuss then you will be getting the marks now using cap and in project appraisal why do we use cap and in order to incorporate risk premium for the extra risk being taken in the company so let's revise it we also saw how the CAPM can be used to help find the discount rate when the project risk is different from the company's normal business risk. So the logic behind CAPM is follows. Objective is to maximize shareholders' wealth. Rational shareholders will hold well-diversified portfolios. A new project is just another investment in the shareholders' portfolio. CAPM can set the shareholders' required return on the project. Is this what we have discussed in CAPM? So that is ERI is equal to RF plus R, uh, ERM uh, minus RF. So now understanding number five is there, students, gap. 
What is the firm's current cost of equity capital? Part B, what is the minimum required return of the project? Is the project worthwhile? Can you do this question? Yeah. What is the formula for CAPM students? RI is equal to RF plus beta VI into ERN minus RF. Now, the first part of the question what is the firm's current cost of capital? First, you need to calculate this. No. What? No. Which beta have you used? One beta, one one zero. Why? Oh man, this okay. I thought I used the upper one. Again, you need to be cleared about this point, students. In the exam, you do the same mistakes. Firm's current cost of equity will be using this beta. That is the company's own beta. Okay, so it will be risk free rate of return is how much? 10 plus beta is 0 0.8, ERM is yes, 18 risk free. Yes, so this will be what is the firm's current cost? This is current cost. What is the minimum required return of the project? How much is the required return of the project? Uh, the project beta is 1.3. So comparing it with it. Yes, we are now going to compare it with that. Now the required return of the project, risk-free rate of return is the same. Beta is now going to be the project one. 1.3, ERN is 18 and 10. This will be the required return. All right. Is the project worthwhile? Which one? Yeah, we will. How? It's having a more required return than the payroll rate. Twenty point four. The company's one is sixteen point four. Sixteen point four. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, your answer is right, but but you have not made any calculation. From where are you going to include these calculations? And oh my god, it's for the project. What is the NPV of the project? NPV of the project is. One to five zero is the cash flow. Initial outlay is one thousand. This is the NPV divided by initial outlay one thousand. How much it is? Twenty. Twenty-five percent. Is it? Is it higher or lower than the uh, required rate of return? Hi, so it is worthwhile. I do. From the market premium, which is being given, it's just 18%. And by investing in the project, the return will be 25%. So the project is worthwhile. So as I said, there has been no formula except this cap. -in. So you can just conclude that whether the project is worthwhile or not by applying this NPV divided by initial outlay. Okay now, cap and gearing risk. Again, this is, you, you are going to find the discussion at the same one. 
but it's it's really necessary to read the theory part so that you can you will be able to uh, do the discussion in chapter 17 we said that to evaluate a project with a different risk profile, a company will need to find a suitable beta factor for a new investment, and that these are the best estimated with reference to the existing companies operating in those business areas. Students, what is beta basically? Beta. They, are tell, they are telling you that in chapter 17, we said to vary a project with different risk profiles, a company will need to find a suitable beta factor. This is the beta factor which you are including. What is that beta factor basically? Okay, Sorry? Okay, no. No. Okay, that tells us about the financial and operational gearings of the companies. So we can take this beta from the market or it can be relevant to the company itself. Like in the previous question, students, that beta was related to the company itself. So in order to calculate the current cost of capital, we had used the beta of that company. It is telling us the risk of that particular company, how much operational and financial gearing is there. Now, in chapter 17, we said that to evaluate a project with a different risk profile, a company will need to find a suitable beta factor for the new investment. So if we have to invest in the new investment, then the beta factor of that particular company must be there according to its business risk. Then, and that these are the best estimates with reference to the existing companies operating in those business areas. The reason this approach work is those companies paying above average returns are assumed to have the correspondingly higher than average systematic risk and their beta is extrapolated accordingly. The extrapolated beta is then considered a measure of the risk of that business area. However, the above only considers the business risk. When using betas in the project appraisal, the impact of the financial gearing must also be borne in mind. So this beta is more concerned with the operational theory. This is related to the business risk, but it has to be related to the financial gearing as well. Understanding betas. Firms must provide a return to compensate for the risk faced by investors. And even for the well-diversified investor, the systematic risk will have two causes. The result, risk resulting from its business activities, the finance risk causing caused by its level of clearing. This is operational, this is financial. Consider these two types of key forms. Both are identical in all respects, including their business operations. So operational theory is same. But A has higher gearing than B. What is going to be the effect then? More risk is going to be there. A would need to pay out higher returns. Any beta extrapolated from A's returns will reflect the systematic risk of both its business and its financial position and would therefore be higher than B. So the beta which we are going to use for A would be higher, would be greater than the beta for B because it is having higher risk. So this is what they were trying to explain. That students, Atap, see here, this one is an asset beta. The beta which is incorporating only operational risk is asset beta. The beta which is incorporating both operational and financial risk will be known as equity beta. So that is for the ungeared company, which is not having any debt financing in it. This is for the company which is geared. This needs to be capital money. Now, using beta in project appraisal. Students, shall we end the class? We can take five more minutes. We can at least finish this. It's, it's 5.59. Using beta in project appraisal. It is critical in examination questions to identify which type of beta you have been given and what risk it reflects. The steps to calculating the right beta and how it, to use it in the project of Brazila. Students, you can read this slide from your home. Let me just explain what they are trying to tell you over here. When you take the beta from the market, 
That is basically which kind of beta? Is it asset beta or is it equity beta? From the market, if you are taking equity. Yeah. That is because that is representing all the market efforts. That is equity beta. First, you need to ungear this beta. Because why do you need to ungear this beta? You need to convert it to the asset beta. Why? Because gearing in every company is different. So first, when you are going to take the beta from the market, you need to ungear it so that you can gear it as per the company in which you are investing. Now, betas are not you know, available for every company. We cannot say that every company is going to consider their own betas. It's not available. You have to you know, take the beta from the market. That is equity beta. You are going to ungear it. It is going to be converted to the asset beta. And then you have to re-gear it by including the financial risk of the company in which you are trying to invest. This is what all they are trying to explain. That you cannot use all the betas in appraising the project. You are going to take the beta from the market. First, you are going to ungear it because business risk can be same for the industry. But gearing is going to be different. You are going to be ungearing it. It will be converted to the asset beta. And that asset beta has to be re-geared using the debt to equity ratio of the company in which you are investing. So can you see the word of re-gearing? First, you are going to de-gear. How? By using this formula. This is the formula to de-gear. What are we doing? By de-gearing the data, we are calculating the asset beta. So what formula is going to be used? We are multiplying equity beta, multiply by value of equity, market value of equity divided by market value of equity plus market value of debt into one minus two. Basically, what is it? This is we are using in order to de-gear the equity, uh, that equity beta. Now, then what we have to do? We have to re-gear it. In order to re-gear, the formula is going to remain the same. How, what, what changes we are going to make? We are only going to use the market values of the company in which you are investing now. You have taken the beta from the market and you are using the market value of the equity and debt of the company of which the equity, the equity beta you are using. Okay, suppose, suppose you are thinking to invest in company A. You are thinking to invest in company A. In the same industry which company A is working, there is a company B. You do not have the beta of this company. You do take the beta of this company, equity beta of this company, and you do de-gear it. You do de-gear it by using this formula, value of equity divided by value of equity plus value of debt, one minus T. You are going to de-gear it. You will be getting asset beta. Now you have to re-gear it by using the debt to equity ratio of the company in which you are investing. So for re-gearing the formula is again going to remain the same. First you have used the value of this company for de-gearing, you have actually excluded the debt to equity ratio of this company. And now you are re-gearing by using the debt to equity ratio of the company in which you are thinking to invest. Got it? So the formula is going to remain the same. So you now your equity beta will be transferred to this one. Clear? This is what all of this they are explaining over here. So they say, when using the formula to be here, a given equity beta, VE and VD should relate to the company or industry from which the equity beta has been taken. Okay, when you are de -gearing. And when you are re gearing re the asset beta to convert it to an equity beta based on the gearing levels of the company, the same asset beta formula as given above can be used, except this time, VE and VD will relate to the company making the investment. 
So this is the difference basically. Sorry? Yes, we are going to continue the next class. Students, we do have three more classes for uh, this one, for F9, and we are going to finish our syllabus suitably in them, okay? Sorry? Oh, that's it. No, you're open. Thank, Thank you, you so much.